Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman. We're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. In today's video, we're going to talk about the four homeworks, which is the kind of work that I give people to do in between lessons, especially people rated under about 1900 FIDE. Uh, this is based on a couple of articles I wrote for a chess cafe for my novice nook column about improving on your chess called the four homeworks. And the second one was called more about homeworks. Um, if you're looking for a lot of chessboard action, this is more like a podcast. So I have a lot of my other 330 plus videos that have a lot of chessboard action, but this isn't one of them. All right, so let's get right to the to the subject matter, which is the four homeworks. And I start out talking about what chess homework maximizes the improvement process. And I say the answer depends upon the individual, what he or she knows, what his instruction or development needs are what his goals are, what mistakes they're making, and how much time they have to devote to chess. And then I come up with some common ground rules, which I can use. Whoops, didn't want to take it off of there. Here's the ground rules that I say that must be true for the homework. Homework must include both theory and practice. You want to get this triangle going where you have, you, you do something, you get feedback on it and then you learn something new and then you do something. So you like you study the Caro can, you play it and then you look at you look it up in a database or an opening book and say, oh, I made this mistake. So you've always got this triangle going where you study, you play and then you get feedback. If you miss one of those three parts of the triangle, then something's going wrong. OK, the second thing is homework must be consistent in level. There's no sense assigning someone to do basic tactics problems and read the advanced book Kramnik's Best Games. So you want it to be consistent. Homework must be eminently realistic in terms of both difficulty and amount. You don't give tell someone, here's logical chess move by move. We have a lesson on Monday and for our lesson on Tuesday, I want you to read the entire book by Tuesday. Well, if they've got a family and they've got a job and they play golf on Monday nights, they're not going to be able to read the whole book by the next day. So you have to be realistic in terms of what people can do for homework. Next is students should keep in contact with their instructor or their strong chess player friends to ensure they're doing work consistent with their changing needs. Sometimes my students begin reading an advanced book that is best completely inappropriate for their needs and at worst counterproductive just because they happen to have it on hand. I still see this all the time. I did a tweet yesterday where I said, you know, a lot of times I get a new student and I say, in order for you to improve at your level, you need to do A, B, C, D. And I spell out what the four homeworks are in, you know, some detail. I have them read my articles. And then I check with them on how they're going. And I say, are you doing A, B, C, D? And they say, well, no, I'm doing A, Q, R, and V. But uh, I also want to tell you I'm not doing as well as I thought I would do I'm taking your lessons. <laughs> and then I kind of chuckle because... They're not doing the homework that I assigned. They're doing other stuff just because they happen to have it around or because they, you know, someone else told them about something. And, you know, you have to be consistent about what you're trying to do. And you also have to be, you know, communicative with your instructor and make sure that you're doing the things that he thinks are going to help you the most. One advantage of having taught over a thousand students one on one is I have a pretty good idea of what works and what doesn't for different people at different levels and so on. And the people who are doing the work don't have that same feel because they haven't gone through that kind of thing as to what worked for people, what didn't. Now, everybody's individual. What works for some people won't work for others. But some things are just complete. It would be like saying you're trying, you're in second grade and you're trying to get people to learn how to, you know, multiply six times eight and they're reading a book on calculus just because they happen to have it on the shelf or something. All right, the next one's important. Homework must be fun. Chess is a hobby, so assigning homework that is not fun is ultimately going to fail. I had a discussion about this with one of my students in the last couple of weeks. He, he said, I'm going to do it because you say it's good for me, and even though it's no fun, I'm going to do it anyway. And I said, don't do it. I said, it's not going to work. and You might be able to do it in the short run. It might be able to help you a little bit. But in the long run, if it's not fun, it's not going to work. So here I'm talking about that. No matter how much the student wants to improve, in the long run, homework perceived as drudgery will almost always go undone. If you're doing chess work that is not fun, my suggestion is find a way to make it fun, timing the problems, keeping track of your results, set new personal records, and so on. If you can't make it fun, then we can talk about it. Try to find something else that you can do. All right, let's scroll down a little more here. 
Uh, too few or too similar types of assignments are boring. Once you get tired of doing it, you would not work on chess at all until you revive your interest in that particular item. So for instance, if you're doing puzzles, there's many different types of puzzles. There's the kind I start everybody with, which are the you know, multiplication tables of chess, the elementary chess puzzles that occur commonly in games that are, you know, things where you win the exchange or you win a knight or something or, you know, very simple mates, that kind of thing. Um, then there's tact, there's positional puzzles, there's more advanced, there's intermediate tactical puzzles, there are advanced tactical puzzles, there's advanced analysis puzzles. There's a book on planning called uh, uh, It's Your Move, Improvers It's Your Move by, uh, by Chris Ward. Um, there's books on positional puzzles. There's book, Pandolfini's Endgame Course is a good book about endgame puzzles. So you wouldn't give someone five different types of puzzles to do as homework. That wouldn't make sense. You would say, well, stick with the easy tactical puzzles. If you get bored of them for a while, why don't you do some intermediate tactical puzzles or do some endgame tactical puzzles? But with the four homeworks, you, you're not going to have four different types of puzzles for your four homeworks. Finally, too many items are confusing, difficult to manage, and make it hard to set goals. A person given 20 different items to work upon would have difficulty setting priorities and assigning time to each. I said, with these factors in mind, I usually assign homework consisting of four generic tasks. Let's list them and consider each in detail. And that's gonna be the rest of the video. The first one is practice. The second one is do tactical or other problems appropriate to your level. Three is read as many annotated master game collections as possible. And I might add also amateur game collections, even though most game collections are master game collections. We want you to read what I call instructive anthologies which are books that are written for instruction. Find, read, find, read, read or watch videos or whatever the media is. Talky chess material that discusses how to analyze and evaluate strategy, how to improve, and so on. That would include this video, uh, these novice nooks that I'm looking at right now. Uh, you know, lots of books are like that. For instance, if you want a book on pawns, you, you would, could start with something like Pawn Power and Chess by Hans Kamak work your way up to something like Pawn Structure Chess with Andy Soldis. If you're looking for Attack, The Art of Attack by Vukovic, and so on and so forth. There's just, a, as we just said, there's planning puzzle books, all kinds of specific books, which would be in that fourth kind of generic fourth homework. All right, so let's talk about each of the four homeworks. The first homework we say is practice. The number one thing you wanna practice is slow games. And when I say slow games, I don't mean 10 or 15 minute games. If you play a 10 minute game and the average game goes 40 moves, 10 minutes is 600 seconds. 40 into 600 seconds is 15 seconds. In 15 seconds, you can't pick out multiple candidate moves. You can't compare candidate moves, which is one of the main things you wanna do. You can't check to see if all your candidate moves are safe. You can't look, work on your visualization to look two or three moves ahead on every move. It's just not possible. So you're not going to be working on the skills that are going to eventually make you a really good player. A lot of people want, say they want to be experts and masters, but then they go out and play 10 and 15 minute games. It just doesn't make sense because if you're trying to be an expert or master, the U.S. Chess Federation will not rate you as a slow rated player unless you're playing games the equivalent of 30 minutes or longer. And those require skills that include visualization and comparison and analysis and evaluation. And you're just not able to do that when you're playing a bunch of 10 or 15 minute games. So the main thing you want to do in practice is play lots of slow games. There's online 45-45 leagues. That's certainly slow enough. There's online 90-30 and 60-30 groups that you can join. Uh, you can challenge your friends to games like that. If you go to a local chess club, a lot of clubs feature slow play. Some clubs only play fast, but most clubs have some slow play. If you go to tournaments, the World Open is going to be in Philadelphia here starting in a couple weeks. It's going to be some of the slowest chess you'll see. You'll get like 110 minutes with a 10 second increment or something like that uh, for the game. So those are really slow games. So you want to practice the slow games. Now, what if you don't have a lot of time and you want to get in some practice? I suggest then if you're above level, let's say above 11 or 1200, you should be able to play fairly quick games. In which case, I would say rather than playing 10 or 15 or 20 minute games, just play a game like 5-5 five, five, where your brain knows it's not really a serious game. You're just trying to practice your time management. You're practicing your openings, 
you know, fast games are wonderful for practicing openings because the same openings that you would learn in a slow game are the same openings you would play in a fast game. And since you're blitzing off your opening moves anyway, you're going to learn just as much from playing a blitz opening game as you would from playing a slow opening game. Once you finish the game and you look it up in a database or a book or an engine, you're going to, you're going to learn just as much whether the engine doesn't care or the database doesn't care whether your source material was a speed game or a slow game. So fast games are really good for practicing time management, practicing a quick tactical eye, practicing your openings. But I would stick to, you know, something like 5-5 five, five or 5-3 five, or, you know, something like that. And I would try to make sure you don't lose on time. You don't want to, if you're going to play those faster games, play fast enough that you don't lose on time. If you lose games, get checkmated. Don't let your clock fall consistently because you're trying to play like, like it's a 20-minute game and you just run out of time. That's kind of defeating the purpose. <clears throat> All right, so practice means slow games. It may mean augmenting it with some fast games. You want to go over your games with your opponent after you finish them. When you finish a game, you always want to look up the opening and say, if I had to play this opening again, where would I play differently if the, my opponent played the same moves? There's going to be a move somewhere on move 7, 8, 9, whatever it is, where you could say, if we ever get here again, I'm going to do this move and do better. If you don't do that, you're doomed to create the same mistakes over and over again for the rest of your life if you're not looking up your openings. I have a lot of my students, when I first get them, they don't do that, and then they... they they think there's going to be some magic osmosis where they're going to learn the openings. And I say, no, we don't want to lock you in the closet and have you study openings. We just want you to learn a few tabiyas. And then once you play games, look up your game and keep extending your branches of your tree that you learned by at least one new move every time you play a game, at least a game where it goes into a major line. If someone opens up the game A4, you don't have to extend your your a4 analysis if you're black because you're probably not going to see it that much so we want you to do that we want you to go over the games with your opponent opponents the most important person to go over the game with are the only ones who can answer questions like why did you or didn't you do these things what did you know and what did you not know what did you see and what didn't you see you want to go over your games with strong players you want to go over your games let the engine do it if you go over your game with the like you play on chess.com and it does that quick engine analysis that's not nearly as good as you having an engine showing you the top three moves on every move where you do what i call in my other video playing what if games with the engine where you say well what if this and you go down this line or you get to the end of the game and you say i gave him a draw but it said i was winning how could i have won and you play a what if game with the engine where you play it out and see how you could have won those things are much more important than reading just those superficial comments that they do when you finish the game and they post the little analysis uh, on the uh, website. All right, so practice, 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 practice. You want to generally spend about 50% of your time playing chess if you're going to get to be a good player. And that includes the time when going to a tournament and going over the games with your opponents, things like that. Okay, the next one is do tactical and other problems appropriate to your level. Now, this is where I have a lot of problems with my intermediate students. They don't want to do the basic tactics, even though they don't know them as well as they should. And the reason they don't want to do them is because the tactics are too easy. And I tell them, you're not doing them to, to solve the, the problem. You're doing them to recognize it quickly and accurately so that in a game, you could just look at a move, a candidate move that you have and say, I can't play that because he just does this, this, and this, and he wins a pawn. So therefore, I reject that candidate move. When people argue with me and they say they're too easy, they're too easy, I say, just go out and play some speed games with someone rated 1900 or 2000. If you're like 16 or 1700 and you play a bunch of speed games with 1900 and 2000s and you look at why you lost the speed games, about, I don't know, I don't know what the percentage would be, but a very high percentage of the games that you're going to lose will be because you don't recognize easy tactics as accurately and quickly as, as the people rated 1900 and 2000 do. And as Grandmaster Shirov said in the, in the preface to one of the books that I have, those basic tactics problems, the ones that occur over and over again, are the basis for everything. Now people ask me, but what about the problem sets you can get like on chess.com or something? And the problem is those kind of tactic sets very often have spectacular queen sacrifices, for mate and twos, 
it's the kind of stuff that sells books, that sells data sets, uh, but they're not the kind of things that occur in games very often. If I ask people, yes, but how often have you got into a game where you could sacrifice your queen for a maiden two in like a serious game where the material was otherwise even? And they say, you know, well, I've done it a couple times in my life. Yeah, but how many games have you won where you won a knight and then you traded everything off and then you won the end game? And the answer is, well, stuff like that where you win by attrition is the overwhelming percentage of the games that you win. So you want tactical sets that reflect what normally happens in games. So you want several things. One, you want positions that occur commonly in games. You want tactics that occur commonly in games. You don't want crazy tactics that are spectacular but almost never occur in games. Much more likely winning material than mating, although mating problems are really important because when they do come up, you don't want to miss them. So you want to do, you want to do a lot of problems where you're just winning a pawn or winning a knight or winning the exchange. Because that's how most people win or lose games is when the material is lost. <clears throat> okay, what else do we need from the problem set? Hold on a second. Well, what else you need from the problem set is you want to you want to do it over and over again so that you can recognize the problems. So when you're doing the really easy ones, you want to treat them like the multiplication tables. You want to be able to do this, this easy problems over and over and say, oh, yeah, this one, you just do this. Oh, yeah, that one, you just do that. Now, when we're talking about the, the harder problem sets, let's talk about what I consider the best intermediate problem book that I know of, which is Jeff Coakley's Winning Chess Exercises for Kids. Don't, don't be scared away by the for kids point. It's really not for kids. It's for people rated like 1,500 to 2,200. Um, Winning Chess Exercises for Kids is a really good book, but you wouldn't do that one over and over again. You would just do it once and do the problems. It's sort of like the difference is, let's compare it to math. In math, you would do six times seven or eight times seven or four times nine over and over again until you can get them immediately. You can say 11 times 12 is 132, seven times nine is 63, four times eight is 32. But if I give you 473 times 36,612, you're not going to say, oh, yeah, I know that one. But you're going to be able to figure it out fairly easily with, uh, you know, long multiplication. But once you do it once, you're not going to do it over and over again until you recognize it. Chess is not a perfect analogy with math, but it's a pretty good analogy. There's certain basic tactics. I think the famous chess teacher, international master Mark Doretsky said, there's about 2,000 basic patterns that occur over and over again in chess games. And... Those are the 2,000 that you want to study. <clears throat> That's why I recommend problem sets like uh, Giannatos' book, Everyone's First Chess Workbook. The first four chapters are introductory. You don't have to do those over and over again, but the rest of the book would be a good example. Uh, John Bain's book, Chess Tactics for Students, is another one. These are books where you have consistent levels. You have things that actually occur in games. They're not spectacular queen sacrifices for the most part. It's the kind of normal stuff that occurs over and over again in games. And once you see these books and you see these problems, you go, aha, those are the good problems. If you go online and you get a, a problem set where they have 30,000 problems, it's kind of hard to figure out how well they are at be being at the same level. And also in terms of, you know, is this one a spectacular queen sacrifice that would never occur in a real game? Those kind of things make a big difference. Now, as I said earlier, there's also other types of problems. There's positional problem books, like Can You Be a Positional Chess Genius? Or the How to Reassess Your Chess Workbook has positional problems. There's endgame problems in books like Pandolfini's Endgame Course, which is a great book, but you need to correct it first. It's got a lot of errors in it, so you need to look up the errata list online, fix the book, and then do the endgame problems. There are um, books with Chab planning problems. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, Chris Ward's book, which is The Improvers, It's Your Move book, which has uh, planning problems. So there's all kinds of problem sets that might be appropriate to your level. All right, so we've done the first two homeworks. The first one is practice, which we've talked about the slow and the fast games. The second one is the doing puzzles. The third homework is to read as many instructional chess anthologies as you can. What's an instructional chess anthology? Well, about 95, maybe 90% of game books are not written for instruction. 
They're written for historical purposes or to show you somebody's best games. Like when Fisher writes My 60 Memorable Games, he's not trying to bring you up from rating 1700 to 1800 by doing that. If it does, it's a side effect, not the main purpose of the book. So <clears throat> when you read My 60 Memorable Memorable Games, it's a great book, but it's not an instructional book. What's an anthology? An anthology is a collection of games for a specific purpose, not necessarily played by one player. So, for instance, Chernev's book, The Most Instructive Games of Chess Ever Played, is an instructional anthology. It's, it's obviously instructional because it's written just for instruction. That's why it's in the title of the book. And it's an anthology because every game is not by the same players or by the same tournament or anything. It's just he's picking out games throughout history that are instructional. I do the same thing in my book, The World's Most Instructional Amateur Game Book, where I take games played by some of my students, including the radio personality Howard Stern, although you don't know which ones are his. And I show the games where it's very instructional ideas that common mistakes that amateurs make. I'm not talking about beginners where they're putting pieces on pre's or anything like that. I'm talking about it, mistakes where they play too fast, they play too slow, they attack on the wrong side of the board, they don't know how to get their majority rolling, whatever their mistake is. And you can learn a lot from going through both the master game books and the amateur game books so that you get a, a feel for what you should be doing and also how to take advantage of things and recognize things that you shouldn't be doing. You want to do both. So you want to read mostly master game books to see what you should be doing but those amateur game books are really really valuable and there's only a few of them i really think mine's one of the best books that i've ever written as i said the world's most instructive amateur game book but you want to read them and you want to read those games relatively quickly i timed myself on reading some games in a book the other day and it was like eight minutes a game but that's unrealistic if you don't have that kind of board vision and you're not that good a player but let's say you're reading uh, logical chess move by move by chernev which is the most basic of all the instructional game anthologies. He's fairly verbose, but once you get the hang of it in the first couple games, you should be able to read a game in less than 45 minutes. And you don't want to try to, you know, go over every game 63 times and guess every move and give it to the engine and all that kind of stuff. You can do that once in a while. It's very good. There's nothing wrong with doing that. The problem is you want to read as many games as possible and as many books as possible and as many authors as possible. And if you do, you get a whole bunch of information. I, I tell people it's like getting gestalt information into your brain as to how to play certain types of positions, how to get certain types of principles in your mind. If you hear it from different authors, it's really, really helpful. But in order to do that, you have to do a lot of those games. When I first started out, I went from unrated to 1900 in two years, and I got to 2000 in three years. And I, in those three years, I read about 2000 annotated games. And I read them fairly quickly. I didn't read all the side notes. If the side note looked boring, I just skipped it. When people say to me, don't you learn less when you skip things in a game like that? And my answer is, no, I'm trying to maximize my learning per unit time, not per unit game. So as long as I'm spending the number of hours that I need to read those games, it doesn't matter if I skipped a note or two here or there. I, I want to make it as much fun as possible so when I get done a game, I can't wait to pick up the next game and read it. I want to make it fun, 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 fun. And if I have to do every single note, that makes it a little less fun and I'm less likely to do that. So I'm only going to read the parts that are fun for me and I'm going to read as many different authors and as many different books as quickly as I possibly can. So that's the third homework. The third homework is reading instructional anthologies, mostly master games, but also make sure to include a few books with amateur games. As I said, my book, The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book, is a really, really good one, I think. All right, the last one is the catch-all homework, which is to read talky chess material. And read is the wrong word. It could, be this, it could be listening to a video like this. It could be listening to a podcast. It could be watching a video where a uh, you know grandmaster shows you how to play uh, an end game. It could be uh, a... a uh, reading a book on how to use pawns. It could be um, taking a chessable course on uh, how to uh, conduct a middle game attack. All those things fall under this fourth category, this catch-all category of doing other things as appropriate for your level to fill in the gaps. And I do that with my students. I assign them to read novice nooks. I have them watch videos 
appropriate to think, like if I see them doing something wrong, let's say they don't understand how you AWL things, attack with things worth less, and why that's important and how that's helpful to look for that as candidate moves when you're looking for threats. And so I say, all right, watch my video or read my novice note called AWL, attack with something worth less. That falls under that fourth category. Okay, so we have the four homeworks and we have, you want to balance them. You're basically doing the first homework, which is the practice about 50% of the time. Maybe the puzzles take 50% of your other time, 50% of your non-playing time is puzzles. Maybe 30% of your non-playing time is doing the instructional anthologies, the game books. Maybe the other 20% is learning your opening tabiyas, looking up your openings after games, reading all the talking material, reading, watching the videos, doing all the things that are not puzzles, that are not game books. Those are maybe 20% of your time. Are, are those things set in stone, like you play 50% and you study 50%? No. You might be one of those people who plays 70% and studies 30%. You might be one of those people who can't play as much and maybe you're studying 70% and playing 30%. But if you get too out of whack, if you study nine, if you lock yourself in a closet to study and you study 99% and you only play 1%, you don't get that triangle of study, play, get feedback going that makes you a better player and it becomes very, very inefficient. So you don't want to do that. So the numbers that I'm giving now, the percentages are just really rough. 50% of your time playing, and of the other 50% of your time, you break it down to half of that, 50% of the other 50%, the non-playing time, is puzzles, 30% instructional anthology games, and 20% all the other stuff, the doing the videos, the reading the articles, the books that are not about games or puzzles, all that kind of stuff, looking up top EIs, look, learning your learning opening lines, those things are roughly 20%. Those are very, very rough numbers. If you love looking up opening lines and you spend more than 20% of your time on your on the fourth homework, and that's fine, but I wouldn't spend like 90% of your time. It wouldn't make sense. All right, so in today's video, we talked about the four homeworks, practice, puzzles, instructional anthology games, and all the other material. What you want to do to get better, you want things that are consistent for your level, you want to make sure you master those easy tactics, do them over and over again until your rating is 1900 or 2000. Even if you're still doing more advanced tactical stuff, you don't want to quit doing the easy stuff until you just get it upside down, inside out, backward and forward. That's the Soviet method. Originally, I would not do that. I would tell my students, go on to the next level. But then they didn't learn the basic level enough. And when I read the Soviets didn't let people do that, they made them stay at the basic level for a long time, going over and over and over it, I realized, yeah, that's what you would do with multiplication tables too. And I switched how I did it to match what, what they said, which I thought was the right way to do it. All right, I hope you liked the video. If you did, you can, you can like the video, you can subscribe. But the best thing you can do is tell your chess friends about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess, here on YouTube. If you just tell three people, or if you go to your club and put it on a piece of paper and say, hey, Dan Heisman Chess, one of the best YouTube channels. I really, really appreciate that if you, or maybe you, you have somebody who does the email for your, your chess club and they send out an email with information on your club, you can tell them, hey, next time you send out information, tell people about this wonderful uh, channel Dan Heisman has, Dan Heisman Chess on YouTube, and uh, give them a link for that. I think the, the actual link is www.youtube.com slash C slash Dan Heisman Chess. But you don't have to know that. All you have to do is go to YouTube and search for Dan Heisman or Dan Heisman Chess, and I'm sure it'll pop up. All right. Thanks a lot. If you do that, I really appreciate it. We will see you next time. See you then. Bye.